Now, pressure. We want to define pressure and what pressure is for us, all right? So to do that, well, let's take, first of all, let's go through the, pre the idea of what pressure, pressure is, okay? Gases create pressure from forces of particles striking the surface of their container, okay? So if you can imagine billions upon billions of these particles bouncing off the walls of their container, every collision that they make with that wall creates a force, and that force is called pressure. You compound those all together, and that's, how we, that's what we feel for pressure, okay? Now, how do we increase pressure and decrease pressure? Well, it's all about the speed of the particles. So if you have more particles, imagine if we packed in twice as many particles inside of here, or if they're moving faster, they have more collisions. So anytime we can get things to be more or faster, we can create more collisions, and more collisions creates more pressure, okay? So it's kind of like a hierarchy system. More particles, faster particles creates more collisions. More collisions means more pressure. So we're always going to be going back to that concept of collisions equaling pressure, collisions equaling pressure, okay? Now, there are three different ways that we label pressure. I apologize for this. I wish there was only one or two, but there are three ways that our community uses them. The official way is in atmospheres of pressure, okay, ATMs. This unit was set up to basically say what is close to atmospheric pressure. Uh, historically, we used inches of mercury. What is that now has been converted over to millimeters of mercury. Um, and that basically is how far would a mercury column rise up based off the pressure pushed on it by the atmosphere. And then we've also used Pascals, okay? Now, Pascals are a very small amount of pressure, so usually we don't really measure in Pascals. We measure in kilopascals. And this, of course, is honoring um, the scientist, Pascal, who actually did a lot of work with pressure, okay? So three different units that we use. The conversions aren't hard. Um, we're going to set them both equal to one atmosphere of pressure. So these are things you're going to have to be able to do. And if you're working in millimeters of mercury to convert for one at to atmospheres, it's a 1 to 760.0 ratio. And to go from kilopascals to atmospheres, it's 101.325. Okay? Uh, 760, I got nothing to help you remember that number. But the 101.325, um, for me, one of our radio stations in town is 101.3, so I can remember myself. That's kilopascals. That Pascal guy must have listened to KDWB because he's 101.3. I don't know. Use it if you want. It's up to you. Okay? So that's what pressure is. Now, we have atmospheric pressure. We need to talk about that a little bit because anytime we're dealing with pressure inside a container, we also have to deal with the atmospheric pressure on the outside of that, okay? So atmospheric pressure basically is a pressure that's exerted by gases on objects on Earth, okay? So because we have so much gas sitting on top of us, it creates pressure down on our planet because gravity pulls all these gases down, okay? Now, we talked before about this idea of millimeters of mercury. So if you took a glass tube that had a vacuum inside, so there's no gases on the inside of this tube, and you stuck that inside a dish of mercury, what would happen is the atmospheric pressure would push down on that mercury because of the weight of those gases and push up this column of mercury, okay? Now, mercury has mass to it also. So the farther you push this up, the harder it would be to do that. So the, this column will rise in comparison to how much pressure is pushing down on it. That height that we measure, okay, is called the millimeters of mercury. So that's where that measurement comes from. It comes from how far mercury actually got pushed up a tube uh, when they first started working with this. Now, normal atmospheric pressure is about 30 inches of mercury, okay? Uh, and then it's, that equals to about 76 centimeters or 760 millimeters of mercury, okay? So if you listen to the weather guy talk about the pressure outside, if he says the pressure is, a, you know, is about 30 inches, um, what he's saying is that it's about 30 inches of mercury off of a, a measuring tool, essentially. And as pressure drops, so if we have less pressure pushing down, this column would also go back down and we, we would decrease pressure. So this is our, kind of our first way we measure atmospheric pressure. Now, other thing to keep in mind that if you have a container that's open to atmospheric pressure, these particles are going to be pushing on that container. It can push vertically. It can actually push to the side. It seems kind of weird, but it can. Okay. The only reason why this piston head inside of here wouldn't slam all the way down and collapse completely down is because you must have gases on the inside also pressing back, okay? So if you've ever wondered why like a, an empty bottle that had nothing inside of it doesn't collapse under the weight of our atmospheric pressure, well, it's because inside the container there's also gas particles pushing back, okay? So there's always a balancing act between the atmospheric pressure pushing on something and the gas particles inside the container pressing on that, okay? If you've ever gone on a plane trip, 
and uh, maybe gone to a mountainous region. Um, one thing I've noticed is you go to a mountainous region, if you buy potato chips or chips from a store, all the bags feel like they're about ready to burst because the bags are completely tight and they're actually really very full. Okay, if you go, if you come here or go down to Florida and you buy a bag of chips, it almost feels like the bag. There's no air inside the bag at all. Okay, the difference is, is as you get higher up in our planet on in the mountainous region, let's say like Denver, Colorado, something like that, you have less atmospheric pressure. Well, wherever they bagged those chips at, when they sealed that bag up, they had a certain amount of gas particles inside of it. So it would change that ratio of internal pressure versus external pressure. Okay. And we'll talk about that as we go through this unit, these kind of comparisons between external or atmospheric pressure and our internal pressure. Okay? So that's atmospheric pressure. We also need to talk a, lot about, a little bit about kinetic energy. Okay? So what is kinetic energy and how does it work? Okay? Hopefully kinetic energy is not a new term for you, but let's review it anyway. Okay? Kinetic energy, we abbreviated KE, and it's energy we get from movement. Okay? So as things move, they need to have energy to do so. And that type of energy that they have that allows them to move is called kinetic energy. Its counterpart is potential energy, which is energy that is stored. Okay, So I think of it this way as if you have your phone turned off, but it's 100% battery power ready to roll, Okay, now you have potential energy. As soon as you turn that phone on and you start using that potential energy from the battery and you make your phone do things, you're moving electrons around, that's kinetic energy. Okay, So anytime things are moving, we get kinetic energy. Now, the faster an object moves, we call it the higher velocity. Okay, or higher speed, uh, the more kinetic energy it has. There is an equation for this. It's kinetic energy equals one half your mass times your velocity squared. So it's not a direct proportionality because we do have a squared function in here. However, this equation is not one that we're going to solve for. You would have more than enough opportunity next year in physics to use this equation and do work with kinetic energy in terms of masses and velocities, that kind of stuff. I put it in here only to give you a reference to realizing that kinetic energy is definitely related to your velocity and how fast you're moving. It's also related to how big you are, how much mass you have, which will be play as a role also. Okay, And then the one half is just a multiplier we need to make it work out. So let's take a look down here. Longer arrows means higher average speed. So here we have longer arrows, so they're moving faster, so they have more kinetic energy. Here we have shorter arrows, so they're moving slower, so they have less kinetic energy. Okay, You could call these arrows vectors for those math people out there. All right, So that's kinetic energy. Now, if we take kinetic energy and apply that to temperature, then we could say, like, wait a minute, what does temperature do again? So if you remember from our previous unit, temperature measures the average kinetic energy of a system. So it's a way for us to measure kinetic energy using a thermometer, essentially. Okay. So if you give particles more kinetic energy, they're going to move faster. Okay. So the more energy you give something, the faster it moves. Well, the faster it moves, the warmer it will get. Okay. So speed. And energy and temperature are all related to each other. The faster particles move, the more energy they have, so their temperature is hotter. Okay, so it's a really easy way for us to track energy by measuring temperature. Okay, so if we remove kinetic energy from particles, they will slow down, resulting in cooler temperatures. So two different ways of looking at it: increasing kinetic energy, they move faster, making them hotter. Removing kinetic energy, they'll slow down, cooler temperatures. Now, if we remove enough kinetic energy, so they get to a point where they're not moving at all. That's as slow as they possibly can move. That's our absolute zero again. Okay. So again, just a little bit of a graphic so you can visualize it. You know, low kinetic energy is cooler and slower. High kinetic energy is warmer and faster. Okay. All right, guys. Um, <clears throat> the next thing we want to talk about here is kinetic energy distribution, or basically what happens to particles when they do have these these amounts of energy inside them. Okay. A lot of people believe that if you take a sample of a gas or a liquid or a solid, they think that every particle inside there is actually moving at the same speed or the same rate or the same amount of energy, which is not actually true. Okay, So what we actually have is this huge range of particle speeds that happen to any sample of a gas. Okay, So if we take a look at this graph here, and here we have you know four different temperatures. We have 100, 100 Kelvin, 300 Kelvin, 600 Kelvin, and 1,000 Kelvin. Okay, And then the number of particles is identified in our y-axis, and the speed at which they're moving is identified in our x-axis. Okay, So when we measure temperature, what we're doing is we're measuring the average amount of speed in a given sample. So if you have a sample of gases that are at 300 Kelvin, okay, just so, you know, that's about oh, a little above room temperature, probably like a really hot summer day kind of deal. Okay, So they're at 300 Kelvin, and you take a look. 
the speed of which the particles are moving inside that, you have some that are moving extremely fast way down here, and you have some that are basically not moving at all. Okay, so you have a huge range of speeds that's going on inside of here. Okay, now as you warm it up, they will spread those speeds out even more, and you're going to shift the peak of your curve to the right. So the majority of them will be moving faster as you warm them up. Okay, so we call this a Maxwell distribution curve. And what I want to do is jump out of this presentation and actually go to um, a simulation on that for you guys so you guys can see it kind of happening. So if we look over here, this is an exact idea of a, a bunch of particles that are gas particles. Kind of give me simulating that. And down here, they're showing a curve of particles. All right. Now notice, this is at one temperature. Okay, so this is not at different temperatures. This is one temperature. So if you stuck a thermometer in here, you'd be reading a single temperature in terms of what we're talking about here, okay? Um, so we can actually cool this thing down or we can warm it up if we want to, okay? But notice that no matter what we do, if we take a look at the different colors here, we are still keeping that same curve. So some particles are moving much faster, some particles are moving much slower as we do this. Now, one thing we can do is we can actually add a heater to it. So now we're changing the temperature. So as we change the temperature, you'll notice how that speed of those particles even spreads out more and more and more. So as we warm this thing up, those particle speeds really expand and they spread out. So that even though the curve still exists, it's not as defined right now. Let's turn the heater off. Okay. Um, it's not as defined as before. But that curve still exists down here. But what we're saying here is that at any given temperature, we have a huge variety. Reset this for us now. We have a huge variety of speeds of particles. And what we're measuring is just the average speed amongst those particles. Some are moving very, 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 very slow, like down here. Some are moving extremely fast into the thousands of meters per second in our system. Okay, guys? We're going to end the video here. Uh, thank you for your time.